All right, everyone. Uh, we will be looking today at H.G. Uh, Wells' work, uh, The First Man in the Moon, and uh, with it, uh, trying to dig down a little bit on the particular matter uh, or subject of interest to C.S. Lewis and I believe also J.R.R. Tolkien in uh, their works of fiction. And um, I thought it was necessary to do that in order to give something of the context for the two men's uh, literary works. They can be read on their, read on their own and enjoyed on their own. And uh, I think that they are the, the benefit of these works can be testified to by countless uh, millions who have both uh, enjoyed both men's works. But I also think that there is a deeper dimension and a, a sense that both men are commenting on uh, contemporary uh, situations, contemporary life in a way that would is almost surprising because in uh, both cases, uh, whether we're dealing with uh, Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, uh, his sci-fi trilogy, his work, um, his so-called apologetic works, uh, or even in some of his uh, his essays, um, and also with Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, his uh, Silmarillion, his uh, The Hobbit, um, his whole, uh, I would say, his whole um, literary enterprise. There's a sense that they're not only dealing with worlds that um, they have imagined themselves and put on uh, on stage, as it were, in our imaginations and allowed us to inhabit those worlds for a brief space of time uh, to entertain us or to distract us or to delight us, but also they are engaging with modern life and its particular features. And uh, to demonstrate what those particular features are that uh, are of interest to them and to which they it seems to me quite strongly object and regard the way in which we look at them to be not only unhelpful, but to some extent delusional and um, in fact, entirely dangerous. I think we need to look to the science fiction itself. Now we left off last time with Lewis's little uh, essay on science fiction. And he talked about a variety of different types of science fiction works. And he said, he so he listed them and, and categorized them, but he said that the majority are not of interest to him per se, but those that are of interest, he says that he would put alongside works like, and here I'll read something, I think close to the end, I think uh, page 71 of my uh, work here, um, about two or three pages from the end. He said he would include those works uh, with parts of the Odyssey, probably the trips to fantastic worlds there, the uh, Lastrogonians who are man-eaters and the uh, sirens and so forth, that, that list of adventures that Odysseus goes on, I think that's what he has in mind here. So parts of the Odyssey, the hymn to Aphrodite, much of the Kalevala and the Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer, uh, some of Mallory, but none of Mallory's best work, he says, uh, and more of Huang, parts of uh, Novalis's Heinrich von Ofterdingen, uh, The Ancient Mariner and Christabel by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, uh, Beckford's uh, Vathek, uh, Morris's Jason and the Prologue, and he says little else, of The Earthly Paradise, uh, MacDonald's Fantasties, his Lilith and the Golden Key, so the three works by uh, MacDonald that he admired, uh, Edison's Worm or a Boros, and Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. And that shattering, intolerable, and irresistible work, David Lindsay's Voyage to Arcturus. And now, now, so he lists these and he puts them all together and he says, I'm not sure, this is a paragraph down, I am not sure that anyone has satisfactorily explained the keen, lasting, and solemn pleasure that which such stories can give. Jung, Carl Jung, the writer, uh, and psychologist to whom Jordan Peterson re repeatedly aversed to in his works, which are wildly popular around the world right now, is uh, Peterson's exploration of myth and the meaning and how they connect with our sense of um, archetypes. Uh, 
that's who Lewis is alluding to here. Jung, who went furthest, seems to me to produce as his explanation one more myth, which affects us in the same way as the rest. So Jung is a sort of a myth maker, and I think Jordan Peterson, uh, to my mind, is a similar sort of myth maker who we find fascinating for that very reason. But surely the analysis of water should not itself be wet. I shall not attempt to do what Jung failed to do. But I would like to draw attention to a neglected fact, the astonishing intensity of the dislike which some readers feel for the mythopoeic. Now he chooses this word mythopoeic here rather carefully. It's Tolkien's word. We will get to what Tolkien means by mythopoeia later on the course. It would be a distraction and uh, from today's lecture to get into that here. But note that he uses this word mythopoeic, Tolkien's word. I first found it out by accident. A lady, and what makes the word story more piquant, she herself was a Jungian psychologist by profession, had been talking about a dreariness which seemed to be creeping over her life, the drying up in her of the power to feel pleasure, the aridity of her mental landscape. Drawing a bow at a venture, I asked, have you any taste for fantasies and fairy tales? I shall never forget how her muscles tightened, her hands clenched themselves, her eyes started as if with horror, and her voice changed as she hissed out, I loathe them. Clearly, we here have to do not with a critical opinion, but with something like a phobia. Now, Lewis, I think, says that with tongue in cheek, knowing the uh, Freudian sense uh, and the use of phobias here and therefore uh, turning a little bit against the psychologists using one of their own terms here, an, an irrational dislike. And he probably would use the word irrational here very uh, particularly and intentionally were he to use it, because of course uh, these uh, stories actually uh, don't use rationality. They appeal to the sub-rational for their uh, sense of power and legitimacy. And Lewis's uh, disagreement with Freud on, on so many manners, I'll leave also aside for the time being, so that we can look into H.D. Wells' story, because this one is, uh, that is the first man in the moon, is the one that Lewis himself cites in his work Out of the Silent Planet. And I think that uh, in order to, rather than Lindsay's Voyage to Arcturus, which I thought, think is also worth our attention, but would distract us too far from the course to engage with, I thought we should look at Wells's depiction here, the particulars of his depiction, because I think that they are uh, not only uh, interesting in and of themselves as characteristic of the genre of science fiction, that's how Lewis himself describes them, at least in Out of the Silent Planet, in the mouths of his protagonists, but also what he objects to and the consequences of the scientific worldview that, well, uh, and when I say scientific, the atheistic understanding of human life uh, that the scientist of his day uses as an objective means of apprehending the world and understanding it. And we see that played out in the fiction of the day. Now, Lewis, or Lewis, Wells's First Men in the Moon is not science fiction per se. Uh, it's described uh, by Wells as a uh, scientific romance. And indeed, in the edition that I have here, uh, he writes that uh, it uh, in the 1934 edition of seven famous novels, which I read when I was a child, uh, he, he states, and I quote, uh, I tried an improvement on Julius Verne's shot, that is from his novel, From the Earth to the Moon, in order to look at mankind from a distance and burlesque the effects of specialization. So note that this is science fiction engaging with other works of science fiction, commenting on it. Lewis himself is engaging in that same commentary, a commentary on a commentary, uh, when he writes Out of the Silent Planet. We need to understand that here. And uh, the editor notes here then, replete with an anti-gravitational spacecraft, a thawing, breathable lunar atmosphere, and a complex underground lunar civilization, the novel succeeds on several levels. What are they? Speculative science fiction biting satire and rousing adventure story. It was upon publication and remains today one of 
Wells's most popular works. Indeed, it does. And it is all three of these things. It is, it is speculative science fiction in the sense of fantasy. But note that scientific romance is not merely speculative science fiction. It, when, he, when we speak of the uh, romance side of it, it is uh, appealing to the very thing that Lewis himself just mentioned in his little essay on science fiction. It's that element that interests him, which he finds in Wells's own work. It is a scientific romance. Now, when we say scientific romance, we're dealing with fantasy. The very thing that the lady who was the Jungian psychologist proclaimed that she loathed. And that's very interesting. So those who are drawn to myth and the archetypal typal features of it can at the one and the same time loathe the thing or love the thing that they see in it. And that in itself is an interesting thing that Lewis himself will explore in his fiction. People are drawn to thing, the very same thing, for two opposite motives. And those motives are further disambiguated in Lewis's work. When he comes to the four loves, for instance, he talks about how things which attract us can at the same time, if they're improperly understood, be uh, apprehended for uh, the way in which they, not, they don't draw us upwards towards heaven, but they draw us downwards towards uh, what he describes as nothing uh, far distant from hell. And so motivation here and intention uh, is a part of the endeavor here and interpretation. Now I'll get to that matter of interpretation towards the end of the lecture here. I think it seems to me a very important thing. It's not just a matter of perspective, but of interpretation. Uh, that, that is something that we need to understand here. Uh, when I look at this work here, the uh, work First Men in the Moon, um, I am not going to try and cover the entirety of that novel uh, in a, one brief lecture. The purpose of this lecture is less to give a plot summary or engagement with this as a novel uh, as it is to furnish, as I say, the backdrop for the works of fiction that Lewis and Tolkien write and how their fantasies differ from that of Wells. And to do that, we'll only focus on a few uh, of the chapters in the book of particular interest to that. Uh, I will say a few words at the outset here uh, about the, the, the general uh, storyline here, because the general storyline is also replicated by Lewis in Out of the Silent Planet. So what is that story? Well, we have two protagonists in Wells's novel. On the one hand, we have a businessman who's, in, who's the narrator. He's Mr. Bedford. On the other hand, we have an eccentric scientist, Mr. Caver. And the two of them discover that the moon is inhabited by a sophisticated extraterrestrial civilization, uh, civilization of creatures called Selenites. And these creatures exist under the moon's surface. Um, uh, the summary of the plot, uh, I'll leave uh, to uh, yourself. Um, we see that at the outset, there's a, there's a simple uh, plot and it's relatively sparse in detail. And that's because it's largely irrelevant. It's just the uh, machinery to get the story going. Um, as I say, the narrator is the businessman, Bedford. He goes to write a play, so he's no ordinary businessman. He has financial difficulties. He goes to write a, a play, and there he hears really strange noises from his neighbor, who turns out to be Mr. Caver. And he finds out that Caver, this uh, eccentric scientist, is, is developing a new material, which he calls uh, rather uh, unimaginatively, uh, but also... Um, uh, I would say rather pridefully, Caverite. And Caverite has the, the power to negate the force of gravity, so it, it can, um, you can fly upwards on this. Now, when it is processed, uh, it immediately flies into the sky. And Bedford, it's Bedford who recognizes the potential of this thing, because Bedford is a practical man and one minded towards material wealth and so forth. So his gaze is downwards. Calvert's gaze is almost like his uh, his uh, 
this this invention, this material, his gaze is up. Bedford is the man who grounds things. Caverite is the man that gets them off the ground. So Bedford sees the commer the commercial possibilities here, and he said and 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 states more or less at the outset that he said that if we could produce this commercially, we could have enough wealth uh, to work any sort of social revolution that we fancied. We might own and order the whole world. And this is a really telling response to this thing. He doesn't simply want to be wealthy. That will be the uh, depiction that Lewis has of his uh, businessmen. He's, he's merely interested in gold for the sake of wealth. Bedford is a little bit more uh, admirable or a little bit more um, uh, diabolical in some ways because he doesn't simply want wealth. He wants to bring about a, so a, a social revolution. And what would that social revolution entail? It would entail that we might own and order the whole world. In other words, he would use that wealth in order to gain power, power over others. And Cavour, uh, less interested in this, more of the scientific mindset, hits on the idea of a spaceship made of steel and uh, lined with glass, and the glass would be made of Cavourite. So when you pull the uh, steel back to expose the glass at that point, the Cavorite does what it does, and it pulls you away from the Earth's gravity, and this would pull them outwards. And, and that's precisely what they then do. They build this spherical spacecraft, they journey to the moon and land there, and then we have described for us exactly what that experience is like. Uh, they experienced uh, the sense of lostness, um, and alienation, they experience uh, and come to the first time to see some sort of creatures, which they call moon calves. This is in chapter 10. And then they see for the very first time the face of a selenite. And I think this is interesting in the light of uh, Lewis's description of uh, till we have faces and the importance of faces, it seems to me. Now, this is not exactly... Um, expanded upon here in uh, Wells's fiction, in part because he doesn't really see the significance of faces as a revelation of personhood, the prosopon of 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 God, the faces of God. Remember that in the Christian faith, and and is it is of the uh, the greatest rapture to be able to see the face of God, uh, uh, and uh, Paul, to some degree. Uh, alludes to this um, when he in expostulates on what love is in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13 and says, for now we see as in a glass darkly, but then face to face uh, in reference to the earthly loves as compared to the greatest of all love, what Lewis elsewhere calls agape love, the love of God. Um, but the two, when they get to the moon, have ideas of colonization, and uh, there's some a really interesting little uh, snippet of dialogue that I want to read here before I get to the, the uh, Selenite's face. Um, he, he says, and this is Bedford, in some way that I have now forgotten, my mind was led back to projects of colonization. We must annex this moon, I said. There must be no shilly-shally. This is part of the white man's burden. Caver, we, we are satap, mean satraps. Nempire Caesar never dreamt been all the newspapers. Cavericia, Bedfordetia, Bedfordetia, hic, limited, mean unlimited, practically. Certainly I was intoxicated. Uh, this reference to the white man's burden is a phrase that was used uh, by Kipling in a famous poem and referred to the context to some degree for Wells's fiction here, namely the colonization uh, of Africa largely by the European powers. And the burden that he speaks of the white man is that of the advanced civilizations of the earth in their own eyes. Uh, and the burden to bring that civilization and the scientific worldview and the progress 
uh, that attends it to the entirety of the planet. And with that mindset, uh, they not only go into Africa, but also into areas of, of, of India and, and China and uh, South America and so forth, other areas of the world. And that is what is being referred to. So once again, note the explicit reference to uh, the, uh, the appeal of this uh, device, uh, this technical device that is to afford them power over the planet. And he was intoxicated. And he, uh, at that point, come upon the Selenites. And I'll come to the, this is the first encounter. So let me come to the description. There were six of them. And they were marching in single file over a rocky place, making the most remarkable piping and whining sounds. They all seemed to become aware of us at once, all instantly became silent and motionless like animals with their faces turned towards us. For a moment, I was sobered. Insects, murmured Cathor, insects. And they think I'm going to crawl about on my stomach, on my vertebrated stomach. Stomach, he repeated slowly as though he chewed the indignity. Note there's immediately on the behalf of on behalf of both men, not just Bedford, who has immediate delusions of grandeur, the idea that they would be satraps, they would be rulers, uh, as um, akin to the satraps of uh, uh, Eastern uh, countries where, where tyrants are in, in place. But even Caver, the scientist, is... Uh, offended at the idea that he should crawl around his belly uh, as these would. So there's a hierarchy immediately uh, brought to his mind and an indignity that he should crawl around on his belly. And stomach, he repeated slowly as though he chewed the indignity. Then suddenly with a sort of fury, I made he made three vast strides and leapt toward them. He leapt badly. He made a series of somersaults in the air, whirled right over them and vanished with an enormous splash amidst the cactus bladders. What the Selenites made of this amazing and, to my mind, undignified eruption from another planet, I have no means of guessing. I seem to remember the sight of their backs as they ran in all directions, but I am not sure. All these last incidents were oblivion uh, that before oblivion came at, are vague and faint in my mind. I knew I made a step to follow Kavor and tripped and fell headlong among the rocks. I was, I am certain, suddenly and vehemently ill. I seem to remember a violent struggle and being gripped by metallic clasps. My next recollection is that we were prisoners. At we know not what depth beneath the moon's surface, we were in darkness and amidst strange, distracting noises, our bodies covered with scratches and bruises and our heads racked with pain. So that's the first encounter, their own sense of the possibilities of dominion over the uh, this uh, moon that they have now, by means of selenite, been brought to, but also when they, uh, but also the contempt that they have for the first figures that they encounter, contempt which is akin to that which Mary Shelley's uh, Frankenstein had when he created the Frankenstein creature, the monster. Uh, and uh, and that that's also not um, surprising. This is characteristic of what the scientific class, those who gain power with the purpose of humanity, invariably uh, feel in response to those who they are the benefactors of is actually not benevolence, but actually contempt. It's a characteristic feature and one that we will find is replicated by the scientists in Lewis's own fiction. We will also find it as characteristic of the uh, the more exalted figures that want more power in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, such as Saruman, who uh, once loved the trees but now has a mind of metal and destroys in order to gain more understanding but also more power. Uh, the Selenite's face when it's described, when we finally get to this, um, Let's 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 describe this very br briefly. Um, Wells says, "For a moment, my eyes sought him in the wrong place, and then I perceived him standing facing us, both in the full light. Only the human features I had attributed to him were not there at all. Of course, I ought to have expected that. 
only I did not. It came to me as an absolute, for a moment, an overwhelming shock. It seemed as though it wasn't a face, as though it must needs be a mask, a horror, a deformity that would presently be disavowed or explained. There was no nose, and the thing had bulging eyes at the side. In the silhouette, I had supposed they were ears. I have tried to draw one of these heads, but I, I cannot. There was a mouth, downwardly curved, like a human mouth and a face that stared ferociously. The neck on which the head was poised was jointed in three places, almost like the short joints in the leg of a crab. The joints of the limbs I could not see because of the putty-like straps in which they were swathed and which formed the only clothing this being wore. At the time, my mind was taken up by the mad impossibility of the creature. I suppose he also was amazed, and with more reason, perhaps, for amazement than we. Only confound him, he did not show it. We did at least know that what had brought about this meeting of inca incompatible creatures. But conceive how it would seem to decent Londoners, for example, to come upon a couple of living things as big as men and absolutely unlike any other earthly animals careering about, about among the sheep in Hyde Park. It must have taken him like that. Imagine us, gagged, bound, hand and foot, fagged and filthy, our beards two inches long, our faces scratched and bloody and so forth. So it's this horror that has nothing like the appearance of a human being, no face recognizable in a rational creature. There's nothing that we could attribute even the guise of a face. I will just leave that at this point and we will um, expand on that further on. I just wanted to go to the description. Uh, next chapter I want to explore and uh, in a little detail is in chapter 19. This is the depiction of, uh, there. in between these chapters, there had been a fight uh, in the cave uh, of, the, of the moon butchers that, who had slaughtered the moon calves for food, uh, and there had, and a killing had taken place, um, which um, is because the uh, Bedford and Caver assumed a hostility in their captors, which they felt towards their captors. And their captors felt no such hostility, we will soon find, but they assumed it on their part because they are creatures like they are. And were they in their position, they would have felt that same hostility. So again, the assumption on their part, a projection. Um, I want to move on though to chapter 19, Mr. Bedford in infinite space. I think this is very interesting. Bedford is separated from Caver at this point and eventually Bedford will escape back to uh, the earth and Caver will be left alone. But Bedford is the narrator of the story up to a certain point, after which, when they're separated, Caver will communicate with him uh, by means, uh, electronic means, and then we will come to the conclusion of the story. But here we have Bedford, first of all, separated from Caver, and then in infinite space. And the, depic the depiction of the effect of this infinite space on him is what I want to attend to. Um, but first, the description of the uh, being alone. Uh, because this challenge of being out of context uh, on, plant, on the moon is only one of the problems that, that Wells explores here. The other is being isolated and without human company, the company of, of other beings that come from being on planet Earth. Now, I will say throughout this that when Wells speculates on this, it's all very interesting, but it is totally void of any uh, theological consideration. And it seems to me that these, uh, the, the very lack of Christian uh, engagement is itself, uh, lends it a, an aridity and a, a lack of, of, uh, of interest, uh, but also a lack of, of meaningful speculation. And it, it's that which Lewis uh, fills in when he depicts a very similar landscape and a different interpretation of what he sees. But what he sees is in some respects remarkably similar. But there's a difference between seeing and interpreting uh, that uh, is key here. 
And the interpretation depends on presuppositions, on cultural assumptions. And Wells's cultural assumptions are that of the uh, Enlightenment scientist, the Enlightenment scientist that sees in things in utilitarian terms and in terms of scientific progress, but progress towards what is never made clear. But the hostility of mankind and its, to some degree, rid ridiculousness uh, is certainly the view of the Enlightenment scientists, and we've seen that depicted already in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein in, in, in two figures, uh, the main protagonist, uh, Victor Frankenstein, but also the figure that we meet, meet right at the outset, the explorer, um, whose name temporarily uh, escapes me. Um, oh, what's his name? The man who goes into the Arctic and it begins the narrative of the story. Uh, da, 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 why can't I come to his, uh, upon his name? Um, nope, I'm not going to come to it. Uh, it's uh, not Clairval. No, it'll come to me in a second. Um, but the depiction of him on his own in isolation, uh, this is this is key. Uh, it's something that the Enlightenment scientist does characteristically. He cuts himself off from community. He cuts himself off from an interpreting community. He cuts himself off from the past. He also, to some degree, lives in the, his. Uh, his present without any sense of what the future may uh, entail, but he does so allegedly for the sake of posterity and for humanity and for the future. That sense of alienation that he brings upon himself in order to forge uh, new things to bring about progress is a common depiction here, this isolation, uh, which I think is characteristic not only of the science fiction, but also of the uh, modern postulate of the orphan we see in all fiction, 19th century and onwards. As I say, the heroes are characteristically orphans, isolated in that sense from the nearest connections of humanity, the natural that the natural bonds of, of a child to a parent. That is not here, and it is depicted most regularly in science fiction. Why had we come to the moon? This is Mr. Bedford alone before getting to the chapter on his uh, on the sense of space on him. He says, the thing presented itself to me as a perplexing problem. What is this spirit in man that urges him forever to depart from happiness and security, to toil, to place himself in danger, even to risk a reasonable certainty of death? That's the question. Uh, he moves on from that question and uh, a couple of pages on here, he says, the great night of space would descend upon us once the valves were closed and he says we're lost men that blackness of the void which is the only absolute death all my being shrank from that approach we must get into the moon again though we were slain in doing it i was haunted by a vision of our freezing to death of our hammering with our last strength on the valve of the great pit I took no thought, thought any more of the sphere. I thought only of finding Caver again. I was half inclined to go back into the moon without him rather than seek him until it was too late. I was already halfway back towards our handkerchief when suddenly I saw the sphere. But note the reference to Caver and the strange sense of, of, of selfishness and at the same time the need for another being who would understand him who, would, uh, who he could correspond to, who he would have a connection with in some ways. Um, description of the, the sky from the moon is the one I want to move to next. This is again a few pages on. When he is asking himself once again in isolation, this is Bedford, what had happened to Caver? All through that toiling, I stood there stupidly, and at last the toiling ceased. And suddenly, the open mouth of the tunnel down below there shut like an eye and vanished out of sight. And then indeed was I alone. And then it's the speculation that's of interest to me. Over me, about me, closing in on me, embracing me, ever nearer was the eternal. That which was before the beginning and that which triumphs over the end, that enormous void 
in which all light and life and being is but the thin and vanishing splendor of a falling star, the cold, the stillness, the silence, the infinite and final night of space. The sense of solitude and desolation became the sense of an overwhelming presence that stooped towards me and almost touched me. What is the, that sense? It's the sense of a void. It's of a nothingness. This sense of nothingness, which Blaise Pascal attributes to the uh, terror of the night sky in his Pensée, the infinite spaces, that sense of void, of absence, of, of being, is that of the uh, cosmology that I spoke of earlier in my reflections on the uh, effect of the shift in, in Lewis's work away from the Ptolemaic cosmo cosmology towards the Copernican one. So one in which there is an infinite, uh, the heavens are above us and all above us and relate to us and influence us. That cosmology has moved away to one in which we, uh, rather in which the sun is at the center of the solar system and we are a planet revolving around it, no more meaningful than any other planet. And what lies outside the realm of planet Earth is portrayed not as a presence greater than ours, but of emptiness, of what we call space, a void, a nothingness. And it is uh, from that that there's a sense of God that is affected by this, not one of presence above us who influences us, a benign presence, uh, but rather of an, a, a pure solitude and emptiness. In uh, romantic aesthetics, it's called the sublime, the presence of an absence, an absence that connotes power. That's what uh, Wells is describing here in the mouth of Bedford that sense what, which he has on the moon of being utterly alone and there being a presence of nothingness. But it is present as a sense of, of presence, but it's, a, it's, it's received with horror. Um, and finally, I said I wanted to get to Bedford in infinite space. Let me just do that. He says, um, uh, and this is a few pages on, Still reflecting on Caver. Now, this again is in the chapter, Mr. Bedford, in infinite space. And in the infinite space is, is important in telling here the choice of words. Reflecting on Caver, where is Caver? And how about Caver? Going back to that thought, how about his companion? His response, he was already infinitesimal. I tried to imagine what could have happened to him. But at that time, I could think of nothing but death. I seem to see him bent and smashed at the foot of some interminably high cascade of blue, and all about him the stupid insects stared. So the sense of him being already infinitesimal uh, and distance from him, and incredible as it will seem, this is two pages on now, page 115 of my edition here, incredible as it will seem, the in, this interval of time that I spent in space has no sort of proportion to any other interval of time in my life. Sometimes it seemed as though I sat through immeasurable eternities, like some god upon a lotus leaf, reference to Buddha, uh, and the nothingness that he reflects upon by turning his gaze inward. Um, and again, as though there was a momentary pause as I journeyed from moon to earth. In truth, it was altogether some weeks of earthly time. But I had done with care and anxiety, hunger or fear, for that space I floated, thinking with the strange breadth and freedom of all that we had undergone and all of my life and motives and the secret issues of my being. I seemed to myself to have grown greater and greater, to have lost all sense of movement, to be floating amidst the stars and always the sense of Earth's littleness and the infinite littleness of my life upon it was in my thoughts. Now, what he's reflecting on here is being disembodied. The effect of being distanced from other bodies and other faces and other persons is to see himself in different terms, in terms that lack spatial reference and temporal reference, the conditions of our human nature. Uh, he sees himself in quasi terms that would be familiar to the Gnostic as well as to the Buddhist. Very interesting. And he says, I can't profess to explain what happened in my mind. No doubt it could all be traced directly or indirectly to the curious physical conditions under which I was living. 
I set it down here just for what it is worth and without any comment. The most prominent quality of it was a pervading doubt of my own identity. Identity, a sense of the uniqueness of himself as Bedford. That is what has been lost here. His personhood. He doesn't call it personhood. That's a theological term. It's his identity. The fact that he is distinct from other things. That's what he loses. I became, if I may so express it, dis associate from Bedford. Bedford re reflecting on himself, I became disassociate from Bedford. I looked down on Bedford as a trivial incidental thing with which I got a chance to be connected. I saw Bedford in many relations as an ass or as a poor beast where I had hither been inclined to regard him with a quiet pride as a very spirited and rather forcible person. I saw him not only as an ass, but as the son of many generations of asses. I reviewed his school days and his early manhood and his first encounter with love, very much as one might review the proceedings of an ant in the sand. Note the contempt he grows from the love of himself to the loathing for himself, the sense of uh, an embodied being as a something that is to be despised, even his own bodily being. And so there's a grandiosity that comes from this and uh, a delusion. And he says, for a time, going in the next paragraph, I struggled against this really very grotesque delusion. I tried to summon the memory of vivid moments or tender or intense emotions to my assistance. And I felt that I could recall one genuine twinge of feeling. If I could, the growing rupture could be stopped, but I could not do it. I could not do it. And then a few lines down, confounded, I cried. And if I am not Bedford, what am I? Bedford, however I disavowed him, there I was most certainly bound up with him. And I knew that wherever and whatever I might be, I must needs feel the stress of his desires and sympathize with all his joys and sorrows until his life should end. And with the dying of Bedford, what then? So what he encounters here is the mystery of human nature. And human nature, he's going to experience under the conditions of living on it uh, for this time in outer space. He's not going to reflect on it theologically, or rather he is going to reflect on it theologically, but according to a theology of absence, the real absence. Note that his projection of God as being this a being void of being, a vast emptiness pressing upon him has had effect on how he he looks upon himself. His body he dissociates from himself, indeed he despises. He looks down upon it, and yet without that body he can't really conceive himself. And so he deals with the so-called anthropological question, which I believe that Augustine first raises in his Confessions, when he asks, who am I? I realize that Socrates asked the same question, but Augustine comes to a rather different conclusion than Socrates does. Socrates, in answer to the question of um, uh, the his uh, the challenge from the uh, Delphic Oracle to know himself, gnothis auton, um, goes around and asks other people uh, if they know more than he does, and he finds out that all he knows is that he knows nothing. And of course, what we find is that his knowledge of, uh, or his claim to know nothing, makes him superior to those who claim to know something, namely those uh, individuals around him whom we now call the sophists, those who claim to know a great deal but turn out to know very little. Uh, Augustine's answer is rather different. He says uh, he does not know who he is, but God knows because he made him. And he says, I I'm a question to myself. Questio mihi factus sum. The Latin rendering of the phrase in Augustine's confession. He doesn't know who he is, but he says that God knows who he is because he created him. And so he will look to God for an answer to the riddle that he is to himself, the same riddle that Socrates had. 
But Socrates didn't come to an answer because he didn't come to God to reveal to him exactly who he is. And when he comes to God, he reveals he reveals to him that he is a beloved uh, image bearer, does Augustine, and that he not only uh, bears the image of God, but that God himself related to him by also taking on a human image uh, and a human person and by dying for him, etc. cetera. Um, but that is wholly lacking in, in Wells's reflections on this profound question of who am I? Bedford's question, who am I? He can't answer the question. He ends up despising himself. He can't interpret the answer. He can look at the problem, but he can't solve and answer the problem. And that's because he's both the subject of the problem and the object of the problem. So he can't get out of the hermeneutic circle, the riddle of who he is to himself. Augustine solves it by appealing to the one who made him and trusting that the answer revealed to him is one that is true. And he also knows that it is one that is not only true, but is beneficent towards him because he finds out that God has in fact loved him and continues to love him. There is no such answer in Wells's fiction to be found. It will, however, be central to Lewis's engagement with these very same questions, the questions of human nature and rationality and, and what it means to bear the image of God and what love, uh, the importance of love in human nature uh, and in relation to the entire cosmos. God loves everything and relates to them in, in terms of love. This is wholly lacking in Wells' depiction here. But note, it's interesting how Wells raises the question. So that was the chapter 19 that I reflected on. Let me move towards the end here because I think these are the questions most pertinent here to our, uh, our, our look at Lewis's Out of the Silent Planet, which we'll come to next. Uh, chapters 23 and 24 and 25. So um, described in these terms. So 23 is the natural history of the Selenites. 24, we come to the presence of the grand lunar. And then finally, the last message, message that Caber sent to the earth. Now, in the interim between Bedford's um, reflection here, we have his return to the earth. He goes back to Littlestone and he communicates thereafter with uh, Caber, Caber, who was in fact not dead, but captured. And we will hear something of what uh, happens to Caber uh, through communications with another individual. But let me come to those chapters now. Uh, so these chapters are now related to Caver and the natural history of the Selenites. It's page 137, chapter 23. Um, and he comes, and interestingly, note, remember last time he, uh, when Bedford was reflecting on himself, he thought of himself to be like an ant. When he described the ants, he spoke of it in a contemptible term uh, of, of, the earth, of the Selenites as ants contemptibly. Now we're going to come back to, again, the depiction of the ant, and this is interesting to me uh, in terms of how it's received and understood. Um, and it says here, uh, Bedford reflecting on Calvert's dialogue, he does not mention the ant, but without his illusions, the ant is continually brought before my mind in its sleepless activity, its intelligence, its social organization, and more particularly the fact that it displays, in addition to the two forms, the male and the female, produced by almost all other animals, a great variety of sexless creatures. Workers, soldiers, and the like, differing from one another in structure, character, power, and use, and yet all members of the same species. And these Selenites are, of course, if only by reason of this widely extended adaptation, incomparably greater than ants. So what we have is a form of collective organization and collective will and collective mindset. There's a collectiveness. Uh, ants were often admired in the ancient world by the, by the Romans, uh, even referred to in, for their industry in the book of Proverbs. Uh, but by the Romans, gr greatly admired for their, their unity of purpose and will and solidarity and so forth and their willingness. But what, what we have here in the context of the modern world is the danger of collectivism and the dehumanizing effect of collectivism 
And I say this because this is not yet the era of totalitarian government when, in which Wells is writing, but it will become so come the days of Lewis and Tolkien. And they're not far down the road from this, only a few decades distant. The problem of collectivism in the modern uh, technological state, uh, which is part of the backdrop for uh, the w fictional novels of, of Lewis and Tolkien and something we need to understand uh, some of the inner workings of here. But he says, the Selenites further are not merely colossally superior to ants, but according to Calver, colossally in intelligence, morality, and social wisdom higher than man. Now, this is the shocker. The beings of this planet are superior in every sense to mankind. Totally unexpected. Not just simply superior in their size, uh, uh, in that aspect, but also in intelligence. They didn't expect that. Also in morality, they didn't expect that. And in social behavior, they didn't expect that. In every sense superior it is this planet now and its denizens namely the Selenites. And how are they then described? And this is interesting and telling, I think, as we come into this. So remember, again, this chapter is on the natural history of the Selenites. How did they come to develop as they did? Uh, the reason I want to indulge in it here is Lewis in Out of the Silent Planet will also engage in a natural history of the planets on uh, Malacandra, uh, which is the name of the silent planet there's a natural history depicted on the wall and how they came to be how they came to be. So he is, uh, to my mind, directly uh, reflecting on, but contrasting his view of the natural history of Malachandrians with the natural history which Wells depicts here. And so that's why I draw it to your attention. And we can note that, that, that whereas Wells presents a natural history void of any deity of any sort, in Lewis's novel, it's absolutely crucial to his natural history that there is a theological relationship that is uh, central to the understanding of how things develop and how they relate and how they relate to one another for that matter. Here, the uh, Selenites, the moon dwellers, are depicted as effectively an unfallen uh, sort of being. A, a grand, it, this is humanity, but superior in intelligence, strength, social organization, and even morality. All of those things, superior in that sense. So he describes the Selenites uh, in, in quite frankly glowing terms, however uh, uh, um, disgusting he finds them because of their depiction. Uh, and then he will come on to these beings, uh, uh, two particular beings. And he will categorize different types of being. I'm going to come to that in a second here. But he says there are two creatures that in particular that he comes to speak to. And they will learn his speech. They learn his speech. Now, in Lewis's uh, Out of the Silent Planet, it is uh, his protagonist, Ransom, who learns the speech of the Malachandrians. Because, of course, he is a philologist and interested in languages. Here, it's the other way around. They learn his speech. And there are two beings. They are called Fiu and Tsipuf. Fiu, he says, was about five feet high, small slender legs, about 18 inches long, and slight feet of the common lunar pattern. On these balanced a, a little body, throbbing with the pulsations of his heart. He had long, soft, many-jointed arms ending in a tentacled grip, and his neck was many-jointed in the usual way, but exceptionally short and thick. His head said Cavor, apparently alluding to some previous description that had gone astray in space, is of the usual, the common lunar type, but strangely modified. The mouth has the usual expressionless gape, but it is unusually small and pointing downwards, and the mask is reduced to the size of a large, flat nose flap. On either side are the little hen-like eyes. The rest of the head is distended into a huge, globe and the chitinous leathery cuticle of the moon calf hinds thins out to a mere membrane 
through which the pulsating brain movements are distinctly visible. He is a creature, indeed, with a tremendously hypertrophied, hypertrophied brain and with the rest of his organism both relatively and absolutely dwarfed. In other words, he has an enormous head, or more particularly, an enormous brain, because there is no skull encompassing the brain. So there's just this gel, like this bulging mass of brain, and it's exposed. And Tsipuf, it seems, was a similar insect, but his, in scare quotes, face was drawn out to a considerable length, and the brain hypertrophy being in different regions. His head was not round, but pear-shaped, with the stalk downward. There were also in Caver's retinue litter carriers, etc., lopsided beings whose sole purpose is to carry these two brain uh, boxes around, uh, whose names are Fiyu and Tsi Puff. Now, Tsi Puff or, and Fiyu have different uh, abilities. They are going to ascertain his language, but they have different skills there. And between the two of them, they master over 100 English nouns at their very first session. And subsequently, it seems, they brought an artist with them to depict, to assist with the works of explanation with sketches and diagrams, Caver's drawings being rather crude. He was, says Caver, a being with an active arm and an arresting eye. So rather than this enormous brain, he is this one arm. <laughs> That's what has a uh, hypertrophied arm, this great arm here is there, and a particularly arresting keen eye to pick up detail. And he seemed to draw with incredible swiftness. And he says, but it will interest only linguists and delay me too long to give the details of the intent parleys of which these were the beginning. And indeed, I'm very much in doubt I could give anything like that. And they have problems then when they come to abstract nouns, prepositions, and hackneyed forms of speech, which we often use on earth, he says. Um, and he said, indeed, these difficulties were insurmountable until to the sixth lesson came a fourth assistant, a being with a huge football-shaped head whose forte was clearly the pursuit of intricate analogy. So hackneyed phrases are in fact analogies upon analogies and analogies, and the connection between them lost. And he entered in in a preoccupied manner, stumbling against a stool, and he is the end who comes up with explaining with the other uh, aspects of language that the others had not been able to ascertain. And towards the conclusion, it was told to see Puff, T-S-I, Puff, in order that it might be remembered, and then C Puff was ever the arsenal for the facts. And then we advanced again. So C Puff is there to remember things. And that's his particular gift, is he is a repository of information. He's a sort of an encyclopedia. He is that sort of figure. And what they also determined through this use of language is the moral nature of man. Um, and and uh, that's that's revealed by Caver here, and here's the explanation. Mm -hmm. He, if I may draw, eat little, drink little, draw, love draw, no other thing, hate all who not draw like him, angry, hate all who draw like him better, hate most people, hate all those who think not all world for to draw, angry, hmm, all things mean nothing to him, only draw, he like you, if you understand, new thing to draw. Ugly, striking, eh? He, turning turning to the creature called Sea Puff, love remember words, remember wonderful more than any. Think no, draw no, remember, say. Here he referred to the gifted assistant for word. Histories, all things he hear once, say ever. So he, these creatures, apprehend from him, not only his language, but also his moral nature from the implications of what he says. And then Caver describes the moon dwellers. And it's interesting to see not only what they get from him, but what he's getting from them. And what is he getting from them? In the moon, says Caver, every citizen knows his place. He is born to that place. And the elaborate discipline of training and education and surgery he undergoes fits him 
at least at last so completely to it that he has neither ideas nor organs nor any purpose beyond it. Why should he? Fiyu would ask. So there's a perfection in the social organization, and it's a perfection that comes about as a result of training, education, and surgery. Note the third phrase here, surgery. There's a modification of these beings so that they develop in ways that are helped on evolution, on the evolutionary uh, manner by means of intervention from others. They are purpose-driven, and they all relate to one another. And what is lacking, among other things, is laughter. The faculty of laughter, it says, save for the sudden discovery of some paradox, is lost to him. His deepest emotion is the evolution of a novel computation, and so he attains his end. And so there are different types of beings, and there are three types of beings that he will then describe. Uh, and these three classes are, are interesting. Interesting because it is Wells that, uh, or rather Caver, uh, speaking on behalf of Wells, because they think Caver being of the scientific bent and being admirable as such to Wells, reflects the view of the modern scientific world. There are three types of individuals who have these enormous brains. So again, there's a, a categorization and a specialization that go with this. And a hierarchy. And let me describe this here. These beings with big heads to whom the intellectual labors fall form a sort of aristocracy in this strange society. And at the head of them, quintessential of the moon, is that marvelous, gigantic ganglion of the grand lunar into whose presence I am finally to come. The unlimited development of the minds of the intellectual class is rendered possible by the absence in the lunar anatomy of bony skull. Because that's an impediment to the growth of the brain. So the, the brains just keep on growing larger and larger, and the grand lunar has a head meters across. When I say the head, I mean the brain. And it's not uh, without uh, reason that Lewis, in the third installment of the scientific uh, trilogy, uh, in That Hideous Strength, the aim is to, uh, there's an, a disembodied brain. Uh, and, and the aim is to expand the brain. And so there's a materialism inherent in this and a, a reductionism of human nature to the brain and away from rationality. And that's one of the many themes that underlies this. What exactly is rationality? In the scientific Wellesian view of rationality, it's this disembodied um, reasoning that seeks to be disembodied and to some degree desires it and the power that comes with it. And on the other hand, loathes everything related to the the embodiment of human nature including his fellow creatures that that dynamic is explored even in wells lewis depicts it as a malign and and terrible consequence even wells does to some degree but he offers no alternative because again he has no christian worldview with which to understand human nature as a, as a being that bears the image of god and is moved by love chiefly the love of god but what three main classes are there? Well, they there are three main classes of these intellectuals, and they differ in influence and respect. The first are the administrators, the chief, of whom Fi Yu was one. Selenites of considerable initiative and versatility, responsible for a certain cubic content of the moon's bulk. Secondly, the experts, like the four football-headed thinkers who are trained to perform certain special operations. And then finally, below them all, the erudite, who are repositories of knowledge. To this latter class belongs C. Puff. So Fi Yu was one of the administrators, so he was a much higher up in the hierarchy. And he was the expert or the professor of terrestrial languages. So note the erudite. The knowledge bearers are, are not the highest in that. The highest are the administrators, those who have power. Um, and they, they use the experts to draw upon the knowledge bearers. Now, no, note this inversion here and the relation of knowledge to power. The administrators who exercise the power have power over even knowledge. And this idea that knowledge is power, so says Francis Bacon and the idea of Baconian science to gain power over nature is here represented in the 
depiction of the hierarchy of the air, the uh, intellectual aristocracy on planet Moon. Uh, because here they're gaining power over nature, um, uh, not on the basis of knowledge, but on the basis of pure power. And yet it is said that this is a an entirely ordered and socially superior and morally superior society to ours because of the acceptance of this hierarchy. So the the erudite are, yes, they're in the intellectuals, but to some, but they are in their place. Even though they have knowledge, they actually exercise no power. And, and, and to this latter class belongs C. Puff, the first lunar professor of terrestrial languages. With regard to these latter, it is a curious little thing to note that the unlimited growth of the lunar brain has rendered unnecessary the invention of all those mechanical aids to brain work which have distinguished the career of man. There are no books, no records of any sort, no libraries, no inscriptions. All knowledge is stored in distended brains much as the honey ants of Texas store honey in their distended abdomens. The lunar Somerset House and the Lunar British Museum Library are collections of living brains. In our day, the uh, corollary to this would be the internet. The collective consciousness of mankind put in bits of information on the internet. And then the less specialized administrators, they fall into place and so forth. And these are served by beings of, of bodily sorts that carry them around and live and uh, obey for that sole purpose. And in part, apart from their controlling intel intelligence, he says, these subordinates are as inert and helpless as umbrellas in a stand. They exist only in relation to the orders they have to obey, the duties they have to perform. Now, what is uh, what can we do with Wells's depiction here of the administrative state as it arises in the 20th century and the bureaucracy that comes with it? It's, uh, I would say, it's a prolectic anticipation of what will become uh, a horror in the 20th century, the Kafkaesque bureaucracy, which often, for all its pretensions to do things that are good, often does a very maladroit and indeed awful uh, things. Um, but that's in the uh, attempt to replicate what is happening here on the uh the Selenite planet, and for the intelligentsia, the administrators, to do exactly an order society in the same collectivist way in accordance with this hierarchy uh, that uh, we now impose on human nature. And with this, there's a transhumanism as well, which I, is a dimension of Lewis's fiction that I want to get into in just a second, or rather later in the course. He says, the bulk of these insects, however, who go to and fro among the spiral lace, who fill the ascending balloons and drop past me, clinging to the flimsy parachutes, are, I gather, of the operative class, machine hands. Indeed, some of these are, in actual fact, it is no figure of speech. And so some of them have not only developed naturally that way, they have been bred and uh, and and Mechan through technology, they have been adapted to the purpose for which their masters have uh, bred them as well. And there's a breeding function, even uh, separated from the rearing function. We could talk, there are specialized breeders uh, there amongst them, but, they're, but the breeders are separated from those who will educate them. And this is also seen as progress amongst them. Because, of course, the breeders are incapable of cherishing the young they bring into the moon, and they're, 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 they alternate between aggressive violence and indulgence, and so they are immediately separated in the same way that Plato in his Republic sees is a good thing. So all of these things are characteristic of the depiction of the, uh, the natural history of the Selenite. When Wells presents this, he presents it to us as something which is in some sense admirable. And what comes out of the, the dialogue with the Grand Lunar is, uh, and Caver's folly is to depict the wars of mankind. And the wars of mankind, and he being the only one who possesses Caverite to get where he is, um, it's inevitable that others will come upon the same discovery and come being the warlike and irrational uh, creatures that we are. Let me come to a brief depiction of what Calvert describes there. 
Uh, and then I want to conclude with my reflection on, on seeing and, uh, on, and acting. But he says that, um, Uh, so the natural history of mankind, he gives as uh, man originally begun their homes in caves and that they were now taking their railways and many establishments beneath the service, surface and the grand lunar inquired about the interior of our globe, which apparently we have no interest in. While we want to explore space, we have no interest in exploring the, the uh, interior of the earth. And I understood the grand lunar to ask why I had come to the moon, seeing we'd scarcely touched our own planet and he doesn't care too much for the explanation. Then he talks about lions and tigers, but the fact that they haven't been domesticated, which the Grand Lunar finds extraordinary. And then he comes to human government and the depiction of that. And the contrast with the uh, order of the Selenite uh, society is, pay, is plain. And for all sorts of work, you have the same sort of men, says the Grand Lunar, but who thinks, who, who governs? I gave him an outline of the democratic method. When I, I had done, he ordered cooling sprays upon his brow, and then he requested me to repeat my explanation, conceiving something had miscarried. Do they not do different things then, said Fiu? Some, I admitted, were, were thinkers and some officials, some hunted, some were mechanics, some artists, some toilers, but all rule, I said. And have they not different shapes to fit them to their different duties? None that you can see, I said, except perhaps their clothes. Their minds perhaps differ a little, I reflected. Their minds must differ a great deal, said the Grand Lunar, or would, not, would all not want to do the same things? Indeed. And in order to he to bring myself into closer harmony with his preconceptions i said that his surmise was right so Calvert is trying to pander to him perhaps if one could see the minds and souls of men they would be as varied and unequal as the selenites there were great men and small men men who could reach out for the far and wide and men who could go swiftly noisy trumpet-minded men and men who could remember without thinking he interrupted me but you said all men rule, he pressed. To a certain extent, I said, and made, I fear, a denser fog with my explanation. He reached out to a salient fact. Do you mean, he asked, that there is no grand earthly? Now, at this point, Lewis, or any thinker from a previous period, would speak in reference to God not as a grand earthly, but as the ruler over what happens on earth. That is not the explanation that uh, Caver goes to. He says, simply says, there is none. I thought of several people, but assured him finally there was none. I explained that such autocrats and emperors as we had tried upon the earth had usually ended in drink or vice or violence, and that the large and influential section of the people of the earth to which I belonged, the Anglo-Saxons, did not mean to try that sort of thing again, at which the Grand Lunar was even more amazed. But how do you keep even such wisdom as you have? He asked, and I explained to him the way we helped our limited with libraries of books, etc., and science and united labors of keeping things extrinsic to us and so forth, rather than through memory. Um, and I may mention as a singular thing that the Selenites use years to count by just as we do on Earth, though I can make nothing of their numeral system. And then he speaks about the fact that there are different forms of government. And this astonishes the Grand Lunar very much. And, he, and then Calver responds, our states and empires are still the raw sketches of what order will someday be. And so I came to tell him. And the Grand Lunar was greatly impressed by the folly of man in clinging to the inconvenience of diverse tongues. They want to communicate, and yet not to communicate, he said. And then for a long time, he questioned me closely concerning war. So note the Grand Lunar sees the diversity of tongues as simply an irrational impediment, as a tribalism of sorts. A Christian would appeal to a different explanation for the diversity of tongues and the goodness therein. 
uh, as well as acknowledging the impediment thereof. But what we'd want, we'd have to appeal to the story of the Tower of Babel and the scattering of of the uh, powers of the earth and why why God has done this to frustrate the malignity of mankind, for him to become as a god, uh, that they would do such terrible things given the can, uh, given the uh, malignity of human nature that God scattered them in his uh, wisdom. But we will find that there is a pressure exactly to do this because, of course, it is an impediment to communication. And he says, with respect to war, let's finally come to this. What good is the war? Well, he can't say, oh, it's the good. It Well, it thins the population. <laughs> That's Caver's answer. Well, Caver's answer is the Malthusian explanation of war. The concern about there being too many people is, well, it, it thins the population. It's population control. It, it keeps us down. So in other words, human beings regard fellow human beings as a, uh, a bacteria upon the earth, effectively, an intruder. This is a totally non-Christian way of looking at human life, but of course it is that of the uh, scientist, the atheist scientist, who sees a uh, limited, uh, limited uh, resources on planet Earth and regards human beings as competitors in that. And this goes with then uh, Calver's explanation of what happens in human history. What does he say? What does he say? I told him the story of earthly war. I told him of the first orders and ceremonies of war, of warnings and ultimatums and the marshalling and marching of troops. I gave him an idea of maneuvers and positions and battle joined. I told him of sieges and assaults, of starvation and hardship in trenches and of sentinels freezing in the snow. I told him of routs and surprises and desperate last stands and faint hopes and the pitiless pursuit of fugitives and the dead upon the field. I told too of the past, of invasions and massacres, of the Huns and Tartars, and the wars of Muhammad and the Caliphs and the Crusades. And as I went on, the, and Fiyu translated, the Selenites cooed and murmured in a steadily intensified emotion. And Fiyu interjects in all this and says, but surely they do not like it. I assured them that men of my race considered battle the most glorious experience of life, at which the whole assembly was stricken with amazement. But what good is this war, said the Grand Lunar, which I've already said, sticking to his theme. Oh, as for the good, it thins the population. But why should there be a need? So what they discover is that the uh, within, within human beings, this terrible preoccupation with war and the love of war, this warlike nature, um, makes humanity, of course, a great threat. And of course, the Grand Lunar in response to this is going to, I think, in the uh, probably the the success, successor novel to this, The War of the Worlds, uh, decide that this, this species cannot uh, exist any longer. But note in the depiction of the War of the Worlds, or the poor of the worlds, the uh, depiction of war on planet Earth. There is no sense of history having any meaning or purpose. There's no sense of the ordering of time in accordance with the um, the incarnation of Christ, the BC and AD. There's no reference to a theological framework for the, the purpose of history. The idea that, that God himself suffered at the hands of others in order to redeem mankind from its sinfulness. There's no reference to sin indeed although it's implicit in the depiction of what man does to one another for the purposes of war, it's even there implicit in the purpose of the good of war, which is to thin the population. These are all sinful explanations, but they pass here without satire, or if they are satirized, then they're satirized without any sense of what, what a good thing is, because there's no theological context for the novel. So with that said, let me conclude with some reflections on the importance of seeing because uh, and seeing and interpreting because i remember the reflection on the on human nature which caver came to um and and mastery because with sight sight is necessary in order to get a sense of uh, of what is out there it guarantees that we possess the world and that it, it's for us there at the same time and and it gives us the possibility of action we can act upon what we can see but at the same time, without any 
sense of purpose or direction, there's no sense of empowerment over that. We require a, uh, a, a means to carry that out. And that is a technical process. Uh, and a human being sight commits him to a technical process, to techne, uh, a means to exercise dominion over it. And the visual image points uh, the totality of life uh, to a world in which we are the masters and also the subjects in that world. And all techniques involve this sort of visualization uh, of this. Sight is the organ of efficiency, in other words. But images uh, themselves give way to uh, the needs for interpretation. We have to interpret the reality that we see and explain it for ourselves. Now, the explanation that Wells has provided here is simply uh, power for the sake of power, more or less. It's power without morality or purpose. It's power without any sense of unity. That's not the explanation that Lewis will g give to this state of affairs that he, Wells, is describing, Lewis will give a theological framework for understanding things and will interpret it rather differently in accordance with his understanding of uh, uh, not only God and his nature, but of human nature in relation to it as a being that has rebelled against God and is in, uh, is in discord with him, but at the same time who is loved by God and who God has given his son to redeem and exists in a loving relationship and a loving relationship that can mean great fruitfulness and uh, resolution from this problem of discord and war that Wells ably depicts. But with that, I will leave off and we'll pick it up next time. Thank you.